Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. I, this is Stephanie Hall, and I'm with the ESRD National Coordinating Center. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for the uh, NCC Professional Webinar event today. As you know, these events are being held in partnership with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, these are a series of events that feature guest speakers from around the country sharing how they or their organizations they are with are coping with COVID-19. Um, before we get started, I do want to let everybody know this call is being recorded and the slides and the recording will be posted to the NCC COVID webpage, usually within three business days. Um, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the agenda today and our speakers. So you heard what the call is going to be about. Uh, today's speakers, we actually have uh, two speakers on today for our presentation. We have Lance Salazar. He's the clinical pharmacy uh, coordinator for Sutter Health Systems. We also have Jeffrey Silvers. He's the medical director of pharmacy infection control with Sutter Health Systems. Also, he's a member of the California Department of Public Health COVID-19 Drafting Guidelines Work Group. Uh, the topic today is COVID-19, renal disease, and vaccination. And I think this is, uh, I'm really excited to have um, uh, both of these presenters. There's just a lot of, um, it's almost like daily changes on what the vaccines are doing and recommendations. Um, I can look, pick up the newspaper, listen to the news, and there's, it's always changing. Um, Dr. Silver sent me some updated information as, as early as this morning. So uh, those are always, um, so we're excited to get some newest and uh, most recent information. Uh, we do want to hear from everybody, although everybody has been muted upon entry into the event. Uh, we really encourage you to use the Q&A or the chat feature, and there should be some time left at the end of the event that um, we'll have time to get through as many of the questions as our time allows. Next slide. So what these calls about, um, we have different stakeholders and peers from the ESRD community uh, who we're going to hear from who are adapting to the COVID-19. They share examples and uh, provide some uh, real-world strategies for facilities to use. And as you know, these are done uh, bi-monthly. We'll be uh, continuing on, on uh, twice a month for the next several months yet. So next slide. So let me do an introduction of both of our speakers. Uh, Dr. Silvers is the Medical Director of Infection Control and Pharmacy for Sutter Health, where he serves as physician lead and expert on COVID-19 for the healthcare system. In his role, he works closely with the California Department of Public Health, where he serves on several advisory committees. We also have uh, Dr. Salazar. He's the Clinical Pharmacy Coordinator for Sutter Health System in California. His focus is on vaccine delivery and clinical readiness for Sutter Health System. Dr. Salazar is also the chair for Sutter Health Vaccine Advisory Committee. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Silvers. Are you starting us off? I am. Thank you. Perfect. You just let us know for next slide, and we'll move okay. your slides for you. Next slide, please. Thank you. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're excited to present information. Uh, hopefully, uh, when it gets posted in three days, it will still be mostly true. Uh, but, you know, it changes so fast, honestly, that it may not be completely all true. But some things will probably not change. For example, the definition. So SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes COVID-19. COVID-19 is the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2. Let's have the next slide, please. So the CDC, yeah, okay, world cases here. So uh, this is from yesterday afternoon. So the numbers are obviously outdated already. Uh, the world had over 100 million cases identified as of yesterday, with over 2 million deaths. In the United States, we unfortunately surpassed over 25 million cases and well over 400,000 deaths, up to 423,000. Next slide, please. So the CDC list uh, comes up with categories of people who are at increased risk and probably increased risk. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, the list of, of adults who are at increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19 is, is shown here. And you'll notice in red, we have chronic kidney disease and diabetes. Next slide, please. So what is the risk of chronic kidney disease? And let's go to the next slide. The so Open Safely is an important study. We'll show the next slide here. 
So Open Safely uh, looked at factors associated with COVID-related death. It was published uh, last year in Nature. It covered uh, patients in the United Kingdom. They had over 17 million adults in the study and had uh, at least a year's worth of follow-up. And they had almost 11,000 deaths during that time. So what was the most common risk factor for dying from COVID? Well, number one was age. And number two is chronic kidney disease. Next slide, please. So here's uh, the hazard ratio. And so they adjusted it for age because age is the, uh, the variable that is most closely associated. So if you adjust for age, you can then look and see, okay, so what does chronic disease by itself uh, present as a risk factor for uh, severe COVID? And the risk in a dialysis patient is 3.69 times. That's very, you know, obviously if the risk is not increased, it's, it's one. And if risk is decreased, then it would be less than one. 3.69 is a very high number. Renal transplants is 3.53. CKD4 and 5 combined is 2.5. And, a half. and di just to give you a, a perspective, now that's just looking at renal disease by itself. When you separate out diabetes, diabetes by itself, the risk hazard ratio is under 2. And, it, you know, the upper limits towards 2 is reached on a patient who has diabetes that is not controlled. The patients who have well-controlled diabetes, uh, the risk and hazard ratio is actually just mildly elevated at 1.31. Next slide, please. So the, we've now shown that CKD is clearly a key risk factor for severe COVID. It is the most prevalent condition, increases the risk of severe COVID after age. And this is the uh, Nephrology Dialysis Transplantation Journal from last month reference, and again, supports the exact same uh, conclusion. Next slide. So if you look at the CDC, the uh, risk of hospitalization date, uh, death, excuse me, by age. And the comparator is people 18 to 29 years of age. And you can see that uh, people under 18 have a lower risk of hospitalization, a lower risk of death. Uh, but as you go higher age, above the 29, then the risk of hospitalization death goes up. When you get up to 65, at the 74 years old, the risk of hospitalization is five times higher than 18 to 29, and the risk of death is 90 times higher. When you go up to 75 to 84 years of age, look at that. The risk of dying is 220 times die, uh, higher. And if you're over 85, the risk of dying compared to a young person is, is an astronomical 630 times. We have the next slide, please. So we're going to talk about vaccinating against COVID-19 uh, because everybody wants their lives back. And we've just shown that obviously age and chronic kidney disease are uh, very important risk factors, and the two most important. Next slide, please. So this is just a little Venn diagram that I put together. And this is looking at normalcy uh, from pre, a pre-COVID state as normal, okay? So there's two things that we need. One is the vaccine. Everybody's on, on the bandwagon for the vaccine, and that is wonderful. But we obviously need more than a vaccine. As we know, it's not perfect. Even though it was 95%, that's not perfect. And as the virus is mutating, developing new strains, the vaccine efficacy may change some. So we need a second piece to this. We need an effective, oral, well-tolerated, inexpensive, readily available outpatient medication. And that's what we need as the other part of this Venn diagram to get us back to a pre-COVID normal life. If you want to talk about a post-COVID normal life where it includes social distancing and hand hygiene and masking as, as where we go, and that may be our intermediate stage, then you'd have to add another circle in there for that too. Next slide, please. So this is just a little diagram I put together on the barriers for getting people vaccinated. And clearly, uh, people worry about side effects. We'll talk about that. They're concerned that it says it's new uh, and what's the safety insured. Uh, they fear that you know, a lot of people think that the COVID vaccine could give them COVID, which they can't. We'll talk about that. There is the overall mistrust of vaccines, which I think is extremely important. And then, of course, politics uh, has played a lot of, uh, uh, has had a lot of impact on uh, people's uh, determination whether they get vaccinated or not. Next slide. So history is being made here. This is the uh, first day slide of, of, of a location at Sutter Health where we received the uh, Pfizer vaccine and there was just so much excitement around it. And I'm sure there 
I mean, we still have excitement in the clinics. When I go to the clinics, it's really amazing. I've never been to a vaccine clinic where people who are coming in to get vaccinated are smiling and happy. I mean, you can tell they're smiling by looking at their eyes because you and, and look at their their smile underneath their mask. But but you can tell people are like they're talking how excited they are and they're happy that it's finally being available to them. I've never seen that with the flu vaccine or any other vaccine. And I wasn't around for the polio vaccine to, to see that as a little kid at that point. So next slide. So let's talk about the mechanism of action of the vaccine and what we need to know. So in the top right corner uh, is a uh, caricature of the COVID virus. And you can see these uh, the virus shown as kind of a uh, circular uh, globe uh, has spikes on it that are red. And those are the S proteins. Those are the famous S spike protein that is your uh, most important part of having uh, immunity against to uh, prevent this virus from invading you. It is those spike proteins that uh, attach to the ACE2 receptor or the respiratory epithelial cells that enable the virus to uh, be engulfed by your respiratory cell and enter it and then start to, to wreak havoc in your body. So we know that's the protein that we need. So next we need to code the sequence of the gene that's making that protein. And the, uh, uh, the coronavirus SARS uh, virus is actually an RNA virus. And so we code the, M code the RNA sequence of that virus. And then we have to specifically code the sequence of the RNA that makes that spike protein. You then create a vaccine using that code. You give people the mRNA and messenger RNA that specifically codes for that protein, and then you make antibodies that protect you from getting infected by uh, this virus. Next slide. So here's some really important points, and these are, these are points of discussion that I hear about from a lot of people in questions. Number one, it is not a live vaccine, really important. Number two, it does not contain a whole virus. It contains the mRNA that makes the spike protein. It does not contain all the mRNA. It's not a whole virus. RNA does not enter the nucleus of the cell. It stays in the cytoplasm. So it's an RNA virus. DNA viruses are a different, uh, a different issue. It degrades quickly by normal cellular processes. So you, you immunize someone with the mRNA. It does this dirty work in terms of making the um, uh, S spike protein, which then the body makes antibodies to, and then, then the body degrades it. And the last bullet here is there were no fetal cells used during the development or production. Next slide, please. So these are the demographics of the Pfizer and the Moderna studies. Uh, pretty, you know, they're pretty similar, so I just kind of lumped them together. Mostly male equals fem uh, female, mostly white, uh, but up to 83% white, uh, almost a quarter were Latinx. About 10% African American, uh, predominantly, uh, I mean, it tended towards young versus older people. The, uh, one of the big differences between the two vaccines is the definition of obesity, and, and Pfizer used a much more conservative uh, definition than Moderna, which used 40 or more kilograms per meter squared, which is severe obesity. And a lot of the people had uh, comorbidities. The most common were diabetes or pulmonary disease, and pregnant or lactating women were excluded. Next slide. So this is really important here. So, so Lance, why don't you talk about the results of this slide? Okay. So uh, the results of the Pfizer study, which we have here, and we'll talk a little bit about Moderna later, and I think in the FAQs. Uh, in the results, uh, 170 participants actually developed disease. So this is how they gave their primary efficacy endpoint and how they uh, came up with this 95% that they, they that we read about. Uh, so in the study, um, 162 uh, participants developed uh, COVID disease after receiving placebo. And of those 162 uh, patients that developed uh, documented or, or defined disease, uh, nine of those cases were defined as severe. Uh, in the vaccine group, which we have here, it says an mRNA group of the vaccine group of the Pfizer study, eight of those eight participants developed disease, uh, one of those cases being severe. Uh, 
so that's where the 95% come, comes into play. That's how that calculation is made. You know, one, uh, 162 uh, out of uh, one, 190 uh, is, or 180 is essentially 95%. So that's where that number comes from. So what about uh, COVID-19 between doses one and two? We get this question actually quite a bit. You know, what if I only get one dose? What, you know, how, uh, how protected uh, am I? And in the Pfizer study, um, 39 individuals uh, developed a disease in the vaccine group, 10 of those being severe, uh, and 82 uh, developed disease in the placebo group, uh, nine of those being severe. So that equates to roughly 52.4% efficacy. So you can really see, you know, where where possible that these patients really need to have uh, two two doses, uh, patients need two doses. So uh, the efficacy was pretty consistent across age, gender, race, and ethnicity, which was really was which was good to see in the Pfizer study. Um, and the older adults tended to report fewer milder adverse events, generally because of kind of a de diminished uh, uh, immune response uh, as well, and then kind of akin to why we give you know. Um, um, the high dose like flu zone in the influenza season as well to make sure that their immune system is is uh, uh, improved enough uh, to fight off disease. So they, they have milder adverse events because of similar reasons. Thank you. So one of the things, uh, the COVID-19 between dose one and two, notice that in the vaccine group, you have basically the same number of people got severe disease as placebo. Higher percentage, I don't think that's statistically significant. I think the take home is that even if the dose uh, protects you uh, after one shot, it may not prevent severe disease. Next slide, please. So the side effects of the uh, Pfizer vaccine are, are listed here, and these were from the initial studies. And of course, now uh, uh, Lance and I have a tremendous amount of experience uh, with talking to people and, of course, receiving the vaccines ourselves. Uh, and so pain at the injection site is extremely common. Uh, Systemic events are much more common in the second dose. And of course, people that are older, and they define old as uh, over 55 in this particular situation. Uh, we could talk about whether we should take offense to that or not. That's a separate issue. And the people 55 or less are considered young. Notice him smiling at me. Okay. Uh, anyway, it, the onset is usually the day after the vaccine was administered. It usually lasts about one day, but trust me, a number of people last a couple of days. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this is really important information that came out before the uh, uh, we had a lot of experience with the vaccine. It looks at the four most common side effects, fatigue, headache, muscle, muscle pain, and joint pain. The uh, first bar graph in each uh, cell here, like in the, in the top row, fatigue on the left, the first one is, is the uh, vaccine, and the second one in the fatigue is placebo. On the second row, it's the second dose. First bar graph in under fatigue is the vaccine, and the second one is placebo, and that goes uh, on and on for headache, muscle pain, and joint pain. Which is really notable is of the people who complained of fatigue after the first dose, which is like 47%, uh, that's really uh, quite high. But look at the number of people who had fatigue after the first dose, and all they got was a saline injection. And the same thing with headache, uh, muscle pain, and joint pain. So there was a lot of placebo effect and concerns uh, in the first dose, but when you get the second dose, uh, there's quite a separation. You'll see the yellow, which is moderate uh, discomfort, and the red, which is more severe. Uh, is There's a, a separation between the uh, vaccine and the placebo in each of these four categories, which is exactly what we're seeing in real practice. Next slide. So we've talked about this already, so let's go on to the next slide. So Lance, why don't you talk about contraindications? Sure, great. So the contraindications, and uh, if anyone's following CDC guidance on a regular basis, you'll see that um, their guidance changes quite frequently. I know it has kept, kept Dr. Silvers and myself on our toes uh, for the last few weeks, that's for sure. Uh, the current contraindications to receiving an mRNA vaccine uh, are severe allergic reaction after a previous dose of an mRNA COVID vaccine or any of its components. And it's been postulated that um, the allergic reactions that we're seeing out there 
uh, in the field as we begin to, to vaccinate more of our population are really due uh, to those excipients within the vaccine, um, including most notably polyethylene glycol. So we know here at Sutter Health, for example, like the, like the CDC guidance in their screening documents, uh, is that um, we're asking patients if they have known allergies uh, previous allergies to things like polyethylene glycol, which is in other medicines and bowel prep medications uh, um, and what have you. So they're not just in vaccines. So, you know, if they have a history of allergic reaction to PEG, then that's a contraindication uh, to, um, to receiving an MRA vaccine. Additionally, the CDC has called out a um, a substance called polysorbate, which is actually not currently in these mRNA vaccines, but has high cross-reactivity to PEG. And so any history of, um, of a polysorbate allergy is also a contraindication. Uh, forward-looking as well is the possibility that some of the um, uh, adenovirus vaccines that are, you know, from Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca that could be hitting uh, hitting uh, the population in late February, probably March sometime, uh, could have a substance called tween in them, which is uh, a polysorbate. So I think this is actually a really good call out by the CDC to be in a contraindication to mRNA vaccines. Thank you. Let's go to the next slide. So when someone uh, has a reaction to the vaccine, clearly we, we're concerned about allergic reactions. But we also have to say, well, it may not be an allergic reaction. And if it's not an allergic reaction, it won't be contraindication getting the second dose. We already showed you that you really should get the second dose. You really need the second dose if you want to be adequately protected. So the two uh, diagnoses that generally come to mind are anxiety, basal vagal, or the third, which we're worried about, of course, is allergy. So this table here kind of gives you an idea of how you differentiate them uh, clinically, uh, what you look for. Can next slide, please? So we could talk for a moment about uh, the B117 lineage cases. So that's the variant from the United Kingdom that has been initially making all the news, although that news is being stolen away by the South African, the Brazilian variants also. Uh, that variant, the United Kingdom variant, was uh, discovered initially in the United Kingdom. It's in over 55 countries at this time. And uh, it has 23 mutations in it. And this, uh, as you can tell from here, uh, that there's been almost 200 cases that have been identified through random genomic sequencing. Okay, We do very little random genomic sequencing in our country. So there's probably a whole lot more than one sees here. This, uh, the, the name of this variant has, is confusing. It was at one point was being called the VOC, 122012-01, which stood for variant of concern, the year 2020, the month December, and it was the first to identify that. People couldn't live with that, and I, I totally get it. So, uh, you know, it's called the United Kingdom variant, but uh, we try to uh, not attribute it to uh, a, a location because it may not have started there. And so the, the, I think the name that is being uh, held to is from this lineage is the B117 at this point. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is uh, what I just mentioned about the, the variant of concern, the year, the month, and 01. It is more contagious, and that's really important, and at least 55 countries so far have had it. And it increases the binding to the ACE2 receptor. That's where the spike protein normally binds. And it just changes the shape, the three-dimensional configuration of that spike protein so it binds tighter. So Pfizer was first out and said, okay, well, the vaccines still work against that strain. And the Pfizer vaccine will. And we, I think we can anticipate that the Moderna will. Uh, the neutralizing titers were the same. So N501, what that means is that protein, it's like protein at the 501 amino acid uh, in, that, in, the, in that protein itself, the N was, amino acid was substituted with Y. Uh, so that's how this works. Now, when I talk about this, when we talk about being more contagious, I think we need a little historical background on this. The Wuhan strain, which presumably it started in Wuhan, China, uh, was not 
nearly as contagious initially. And then as it migrated down towards uh, southwestern China, was working its way over towards Europe, it mutated to something called D614G. So the 614 amino acid in that protein, the spike protein, the amino acid D was substituted by G. That actually became much more contagious. That strain, which is much more contagious than Wuhan strain, is now the dominant strain in the world. This new strain in the, that we've identified as the United Kingdom, B117, is actually a lot more contagious than the D614G. Partially explains why Wuhan was able to uh, get control of the virus and it's been so difficult in Europe and other countries, including the United States, uh, since then. Next slide, please. So this just shows what they call plaque reduction neutralization titers, PRNT. That's a, it's a complicated uh, methodology that's done uh, in really in only sophisticated labs, uh, high-level research like a CDC-level lab. Not even the most state labs can they do this. But what they showed is that if you, you look at uh, people who receive the vaccine and you look at their neutralizing titers and you say, okay, if I develop a strain that has the original N501 amino acid or the Y501, is the vaccine still efficacious? And the answer is yes. Next slide. So we're going to start with some frequently asked questions now. Next slide, please. Are the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines equivalent? So the answer to this is, you know, get a little bit of feedback. Okay, I think there's better. Um, is essentially yes. You know, as we presented some of the numbers for uh, Pfizer and their 95% uh, efficacy in their primary endpoint for Moderna, for example, uh, in their vaccine group, uh, they had 11 confirmed cases of disease, you know, uh, after the second dose and uh, 185 cases in the placebo group equivalent uh, to for an equivalent of 94, 94.1% uh, efficacy after two doses. And for a vaccine, this is outstanding efficacy. I mean, if we look at, you know, year over year, uh, with our flu vaccine, you know, we're looking at about 40 to 60 percent uh, efficacy. And so uh, the mRNA vaccines have really been shown to to diminish disease uh, after two doses. Next slide, please. So we talked a little bit about this. What is the variant strain and will the vaccine still work? Yeah, so the SARS-CoV-2 virus is an RNA virus. It uh, mutates, uh, the, how quickly it mutates is partially dependent on how much virus is around. And right now it is uh, heavily uh, circulating throughout the world in, in such high volumes that the number of mutations will increase. In addition, uh, the RNA viruses uh, don't correct, self-correct their mutations, whereas DNA viruses do replication do. So the RNA viruses actually look at those, virus, uh, those mutations, and so there's a lot more in that respect. The mutant strain initially identified in the UK is, again, about 30 50 percent more contagious. And it's been the question of whether it will cause, is whether it's more virulent and cause more uh, severe disease is not completely known, but the suggestion at this point is that it will. It has found, like I said earlier, in at least 55 countries. Data does show that the vaccine should work for this strain. Next slide, please. So outside of work, if everyone has received two doses of the vaccine, do we still need to socially distance and mask? Well, you know, this has been interesting watching uh, watching the vaccination rates across the country, you know, about what's happening and talking about allocation and distribution and, you know, do we have any shortages of, of doses out there? And, you know, so I think really this is kind of a question to ask really early in our in our efforts and campaigns to, to vaccinate. But, and so at this time, you know, widespread vaccination against COVID-19 yeah, might not be achieved until uh, mid-2021, uh, sometime this summer. And so, therefore, you know, I think, of course, at this time, still social distancing and masking practices are still necessary and until it's determined we can safely reduce our, our current guidelines. So we need to watch, you know, the cases. We need to, to, to make sure that uh, uh, we are vaccinating and getting these campaigns going and vaccinating as pe uh, people with two doses as soon as as soon as possible. And then we can really start to talk about lessening the time uh, uh, to be able to be around each other again and, and having masking being necessary. Uh, next slide, please. So I developed COVID-19 after my first dose of the vaccine. 
Why didn't it work? So vaccines in general do not provide any protection the first week uh, because your body has to form antibodies. So we can tell you if you got COVID within, within the first week, it was irrelevant whether you got the vaccine because the vaccine hadn't had a chance to produce antibodies. Now the question is whether you get it in the subsequent weeks before the second dose. And I showed you the data it, with the Pfizer, at least. It may be only 50% protective between the next few weeks before the second dose. And the Moderna is not going to be a whole lot different. So uh, it is, that's why you need two uh, doses of vaccine and it's incomplete protection to no protection depending on when you develop the, the viral infection. Next slide. If I still had the vaccine, can I still acquire COVID-19? And so we kind of touched on this from a one dose perspective, but what if you're fully vaccinated, right? And we, we talked about the studies. And so, you know, with a 5% possibility right here, you know, small numbers of otherwise healthy people can still get COVID-19. No vaccine is absolutely perfect, although we have a high efficacy rate for these two mRNA vaccines. And with regard to chronic kidney disease patients, we, we, we you know, we don't have enough data on some specific patient populations. Uh, and so, you know, it's hard to say whether the vaccine works exactly the same uh, in that pop in this population. So, your but your risk of getting COVID might be higher with, you know, with that disease. So. And then also you have to remember uh, when they did these studies, uh, they did not determine whether people who received the vaccine uh, developed asymptomatic disease. Right. Uh, so they only measured symptomatic disease. Correct. Next slide. So can I be vaccinated if I have severe reactions to other things? So as of today, this is the guidance, and if it changes tomorrow or next week, I wouldn't be surprised. So individuals with the history of food, pet, insect, venom, environmental, dot, 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 other allergies, unrelated to vaccines or injectable therapies can receive the vaccine. Now, we mentioned that they're allergic to PEG or polysorbate, that's a separate issue. History of allergy to oral medication could still be uh, vaccinated. Non-serious allergic reactions to vaccines or injectables is fine. Uh, and a family history of anaphylaxis, is, it does not mean you will have anaphylaxis. And if you've had a history of anaphylaxis, again, not related to vaccines or injectable therapy, you can receive the vaccine. Uh, Typically and, and appropriately, people should be watched 30 minutes after the vaccine if they have any of that, those particular allergy histories. Next slide, please. So who should not receive an mRNA vaccine? Right, we talked about quite, a, quite a bit about this in, uh, in earlier in the presentation. So we talked about severe allergic reactions to a previous dose of mRNA vaccine. We did mention PEG and, and polysorbate. So these are individuals that just should not receive an mRNA vaccine. In fact, we screen and, and we refer patients back to their PCP, um, but uh, more than likely they will probably may need to wait until a different um, platform of COVID vaccine is released uh, into the population. Um, additionally, I want to comment also about uh, CDC's further guidance on patients with um, allergies to other vaccines or other injectable therapies. Um, they have a strong recommendation as well that these particular individuals should uh, talk to their provider, their, their primary care physician, to determine whether or not it's actually safe for them to receive vaccines. So one of the things we're doing now at Sutter Health as well is asking patients if they have this allergy and, in addition, if they've spoken to their PCP for clearance of receiving the vaccine. And if they have not, we're asking them to do so before they schedule their uh, appointment to receive their vaccine. So next slide. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, and we're also working with multiple allergists in different counties in the Sutter Health footprint in Northern California to uh, develop a procedure and protocol for scratch tests, intradermal testing, and perhaps uh, graded uh, vaccination depending on the response to the first two items. Next slide, please. So what about the vaccine in pregnancy, breastfeeding, and fertility? This is, of course, if anyone was following any of the studies, was a hot topic at uh, the VRBAC meetings and as well as a, at a ECIP. Yeah, so as you, as you know, uh, if you're involved with OB at all, uh, that, uh, uh, pregnant women are frequently excluded from vaccine studies. They're frequently excluded from medication studies. 
and then the studies are done, and then they have no data, and then they make a decision whether you can receive it based on no data because they were excluded. Now, with that said, the antibodies that you're developing after vaccination uh, are not likely to cause any problem with fertility. Uh, you don't have the, um, the ACE2 uh, receptors in, in the uterus. Uh, you are, uh, it, it, there's really no plausible reason at this point where you should have a uh, autoimmune response that would possibly affect fertility. Uh, number two, for breastfeeding, you know, uh, antibodies developed back after vaccination is usually get into breast milk, and breast milk uh, is a great source of protection for, uh, for babies as they're developing before their immune system has a chance to start to mature, before they have, they're old enough to even receive any vaccines. So the CDC and the major women's health uh, medical society. So that's the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the uh, Maternal Fetal Medicine Society. They actually support use of the vaccine in all of these populations. As for fertility, uh, there's, there's no data yet. Uh, the feeling is that it should not affect fertility. Uh, but again, and again, there's, it's all permissive there. They're all saying, well, we don't have the data, but we believe in this population should be uh, safe. If you are a healthcare worker and you're pregnant uh, so, and you're in a high-risk population, uh, then you know, that's uh, one who really needs to go out of their way to uh, get vaccinated and protect yourself because there is an increased risk of a severe disease and ending up in the ICU. Next slide, please. If I had COVID, how long do I wait to get vaccinated? Yeah, well, this is a, can be a moving target as well sometimes from the CDC. So, uh, but current guidance is, you know, you should wait to get vaccinated until after the illness has resolved and that you are no longer uh, in isolation. And we're recommending a minimum of 10 days from onset of symptoms and no fever without taking any medications to reduce temperature for the last 24 hours, like, you know, uh, acetaminophen, Tylenol, or ibuprofen, Motrin, you know, Advil. Uh, and that you have you have improved symptoms now that you know the CDC says that you know uh, patients who had COVID disease, whether it be symptomatic or asymptomatic, should not be turned away. They do have some, some guidance in there as well that says you know hey you know if you were at symptomatic disease or you know, you could defer for you know 90 days or you know if you like if desired. But again, these are not contraindications. It's just guidance from the CDC, and it it could could change you know uh, in the next few days or next week. Uh, anything to add, Dr. Silvers here? I think this is good for three days. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. So if I had COVID, how long do I wait to get vaccinated? So immunosuppressed patients, like kidney transplant patients, should wait up to 20 days. And you really need to discuss that with your local expert. The CDC says up to 20 days. It doesn't say 20 days. And because data isn't really there, we don't know. Uh, if but uh, that's kind of uh, that's a local decision, so you could discuss it with your attending, your primary doctor, whoever you feel comfortable discussing with. There is no right or wrong on that one. Uh, what's important is that you are uh, out of isolation for disease. So if they were keeping you in isolation for 20 days for COVID, even if it's asymptomatic, then once you're out of isolation, you can get your vaccine. Now, this is an area that hasn't changed yet. Uh, and they've been pretty consistent so far. If you were treated with the mono or biclonal antibodies, such as bamlanuzumab, which is the uh, Lilly product, or the Regeneron biclonal uh, products, or, uh, or COVID uh, convalescent plasma, you should wait for a full 90 days after receipt. Next slide, please. What do I want you to take home? Next slide. Go for it. Oh, okay. Well, we're, <laughs> we're pulling audibles here. And so uh, remember, we are now into the next phase of a historical, you know, pandemic. So we're now vaccinating. I think there's a lot of, you know, uh, what's what's going to happen next. Uh, and so, you know, the, the population, everything is evolving and changing over time. So I think we need to just keep in mind that we're, it's a historical time. You know, uh, there's, it's unprecedented and things are constantly changing and evolving. Uh, patients with kidney disease are uh, at increased risk to have severe COVID-19 and to be hospitalized, uh, requiring mechanical ventilation or, or to die. So, and so now is our opportunity to put all of our work into action. We worked so hard over the last few months 
to to get ready. And and now that these vaccines are here, and now that you know the CDC is starting to recommend other tiers in their rollout plan, it's time to roll up our sleeves and and begin you know vaccinating as many people as we possibly can. Next slide. So we want you to understand part of your take home. The mRNA vaccines have been proven effective. Very exciting. There's no living virus. Pregnancy, breastfeeding, breastfeeding, I'm sorry, and fertility, uh, they actually should be unaffected and they are not warnings or contraindications, uh, but it's reasonable. Obviously, you'd want to talk with someone because we don't have enough data yet, but logic that when you look at the data we have, they look like they should be very safe. Short-term symptomatic reactions are definitely very common after the second dose. Almost everybody gets some form of reaction after the second dose. Uh, some people get it after, a number of people get after the first, but the majority don't after the first dose. Um, but clearly, when you look at the benefit versus the risk, uh, the benefit outweighs risk far and away. Next slide. All right. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Silvers and Salazar. This was wonderful. A lot of information uh, that you provided. Uh, and we do have some questions that came in through the chat. Uh, I do want to remind everybody that if you have questions, please submit them through the chat. We're going to go ahead and uh, go over some of those, but feel free to submit them. We still have um, some time here that we should be able to get through uh, quite a few of them. So, I will start right off, and the um, question comes in, has there been any deaths related to the COVID vaccine? So there was one person who was just reported the other day who have uh, died fairly shortly after the COVID vaccine. I have not seen any details yet on the age of the person, underlying comorbidities. I, I actually have, I don't have any, any information, so I can say maybe one, maybe not. Uh, more to come on that one. Okay. Um, what what are the other mRNA vaccines that are out there that people are getting or may have gotten? None. Okay. Go on. I'm sorry. I didn't, go away. I didn't know if we were switching. It's fine. Uh, yeah. But that's a great question, though, actually. These are the first two mRNA vaccines. Uh, the platform has been studied for a few years. I think that has a lot to do with why... Uh, you saw these things get approved so rather, you know, rather quickly, although they were doing some of the study phases in, in, in tandem versus, you know, sequentially like you usually do with studies. Uh, but officially, these are the first two mRNA vaccines to be uh, used uh, in the population. Well, I have a kind of a question that uh, kind of feeds into the vaccination. What is happening or any updates with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that they were working on? So, Lance, I'll let you go on that one. Yeah, sure. sure. The, jo the Johnson and Johnson vaccine uh, is expected. Now, don't quote me on this, but we've heard from Johnson and Johnson that they expect to have um, the, the committee's called VRBAC, uh, Vi Vaccines and Related Biologics Advisory Committee. They're the group that makes the recommendation to the FDA of whether or not uh, an EUA, an early use authorization, should be approved. Uh, and they are expecting the VRBAC uh, committee to meet February, I think it's the 25th, whatever that Thursday is, right? And I don't have a calendar in front of me. Mm -hmm. So we could see the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, in our population potentially as early as the first week of March. Now, for those of you following uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that's a one-dose vaccine that they're, they're uh, planning to uh, that they've submitted for early use authorization. They are also studying a two-dose series as, as well called Ensemble 2 is that study. And um, part of that, why they're doing that, is not so much that they don't have um, a belief that the one dose is effective, but that really because of these variants that are coming to, to market, they want to make sure that they practice their due diligence and out of curiosity that they are also studying a two-dose regimen with their vaccine. Oh, it is a two dose. Okay. No, no, they're they're, oh. they're submitting for a one dose right now, right. but they're okay. also studying, yeah, two, two dose. Okay. And is that an mRNA vaccine? No, no. It, it is not. Okay. It's, it's actually what's called an adenovirus vector vaccine. They're actually it's actually a live uh, vaccine. Hmm. Um, so. 
Yeah. So it is Good. quite a different platform. The AstraZeneca vaccine, which is a two-dose series, is also an MR, uh, adenovirus vaccine. So it's funny. We're seeing mRNA, two mRNA vaccines. Now we're potentially going to see two adenovirus vaccines come uh, into the population potentially at this similar timeline. Great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So the adenovirus yeah. vaccines are, are important. What they do is they uh, remove genetic, the genetic sequences that enable the uh, virus to um, make complete, uh, to replicate completely and make additional copies of itself. Then they put the S spike protein in. They give the adenovirus vaccine in the arm, and then that virus is not dead. It can't make more of itself, but it can make bits and pieces of itself. By the way, it makes a lot of bits and pieces of the S spike protein, and you therefore make antibodies against the S spike protein. Theoretically, this may have some additional value. Uh, because a live virus is a little bit more likely, or maybe a lot more likely, to uh, improve your T cell response for immunity. And the strains they're using now are uh, from chimpanzee or gorilla, depending which mm-hmm. virus, uh, virus uh, vaccine you're getting. So they have to use uh, adenovirus strains that it's unlikely that you see. Well, great, great. Good, thank you. Um, let's see, we've got. The questions are rolling in here. So it says, can you explain again how the body responds to the vaccine since there is no live virus? Also, is there an antibody that the body makes in response to the vaccine? And how will we know how often we will need to be revaccinated? So, Erica, those are great questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So the, when you give the mRNA in the vaccine, it gets into the interstitial space or into the muscle, depending on, you know, a little bit of both. And that mRNA gets translated to form the S-spike protein. The S-spike protein then stimulates your immune system to make antibodies to it. That mRNA is there for a little while, and then the body breaks it down, it's gone. It doesn't get into your bloodstream. The S-spike proteins don't get into your bloodstream. The antibodies that you make against the S-spike protein do get into your bloodstream. So uh, is there an antibody that makes the response to vaccine? I answered that. And how uh, will we know how often we will need to be revaccinated? That is really a moving target. Uh, you know, depending on which study you read, I, I think you can anticipate that revaccination is going to be a standard. Uh, I think if we can only have to do it once a year, I think that would be really good. I think, you know, people talking about maybe every couple of years uh, may not be saying that much longer with all the variants that are occurring. I think ideally, if I, if I had my wish list uh, uh, addressed, I would hope that they would incorporate it into the flu vaccine so that once a year when you get your flu vaccine, you get your, your COVID vaccine at the same time in, in the same shot, and then you're on your way. Oh, well, come on that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, there were supposed details about a decreased integrity of the commercial vaccine versus what was tested for efficacy in the initial laboratory studies. Can you confirm or expound on that detail? I have not heard that. I have not read anything that specifically talked about that. Mm-hmm. I will, I'll look it up later, but no, I actually have not seen anything where they talked about that. Um, you know, we, we talked about the San Diego outbreak recently and whether or not I mean, that was a commercial vaccine, whether the integrity of that was altered. Uh, and that's why the Moderna a lot was taken off the market for a little while while they investigated that. And a very thorough investigation was done, uh, looking at uh, all the components of the vaccine, uh, making sure there were no genetic, genetic mutations, making sure that the excipients, all the, the things like the polyethylene glycol and stuff were at the appropriate levels. Uh, and they uh, did a very thorough investigation uh, and meeting with allergists and, and the CDC and CDPH and uh, with the patients who had the allergic reactions to try and sort them out. And they couldn't find anything there. And, it, and they, uh, the vaccine lot had still already been on the market other places and nobody else was reporting it. So uh, they uh, released a lot and there's not been any problems since then. So if that's what you're talking about, then that's the information that you have for that study. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a this is a, a kind of a convoluted question. It says I have a patient who received the first dose on January second, but got COVID and was still in isolation. 
when we did the second dose on January 23rd. CVS is coming back on February 13th for those who received first doses on the 23rd. Can this patient still receive her second dose six weeks after her first dose? Okay, Lance. Yeah, so that, that's that's a great question because this has also been somewhat of a moving target as well with the CDC. I think their latest guidance says up to six weeks. Uh, their original guidance was just, you know, if you miss the target date of that second dose, um, it looks like this one would be the Pfizer vaccine being a 21-day uh, interval here on this uh, question. Uh, is to, you know, give it as soon as possible, even you know, if they miss that date. And now I think they're advising up to six weeks. Um, I think, and Jeff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I, I interpreted the six-week um, cutoff, so to speak, from the CDC as being uh, translatable from the studies whereby actually in, in the Pfizer and I think the Moderna studies, um, the range, even though they have this target of uh, on day 21 for a second dose of Pfizer and day 28 for a second dose of Moderna, that they did have some patients in the study receive um, second dose of vaccine all the way up to day 42, uh, which would essentially be, what is that? That is six weeks, I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. I believe that's where that number came from, in my opinion, but uh, yeah. I could be wrong. So. And another moving target. Yeah, they, they just came out with that change a few days ago. So Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Well, I think you've probably answered this next one, but if the person gets one dose of COVID vaccine, have to wait for months before the second dose be given, would the person have to start over to get the 20 way, 21 or 28 day gap? Lance? Yeah, so even after the six yeah. weeks, you know, I think our advice would be to still give that second dose uh, simply because even beyond the six week cutoff that CDC has supposedly put out there, they haven't provided guidance to say, well, then re series the individual, right? Uh, so, um, I, I, I think, you know, uh, and, and Dr. Silvers, you can, you know, add to this if you agree or disagree, but they should still receive that second dose, even if it's beyond the six-week uh, interval. Yeah, the CDC specifically says, you know, we want you to do it within six weeks. If you get it later, you do not have to repeat it. Yeah. It's right. done. Okay, so that's the answer on that one. For today. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes. <laughs> so, um Jane asked, what's better, the mRNA or the live virus vaccines? Don't really know, because uh, we haven't seen the live virus, you know, the, specifically the adenovirus vaccine uh, data yet. Uh, it, the mRNA vaccine set an extremely high efficacy target. It's been really hard for the adenovirus vaccines to uh, get that to 95% efficacy. But what we don't know, and we won't have this data for a while, is what's the immune response, uh, not just not just uh, antibodies, but also your uh, T cells, what's it called, CD4 and CD8. What's that immune response going to be? Is it going to be higher with the adenovirus vaccine versus the mRNA, the equivalent lower? We'll have to sort that out. So no, no answer yet. Okay. Um, I have a question about um, dialysis patients and cohorting them. So if a dialysis patient was uh, either hospitalized or maybe not, but had COVID, recovered, but continues to have positive uh, COVID tests, I mean, does that patient, should that patient be cohorted in the dialysis units? So I'll take that one, Lance. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So we know that positive nasopharyngeal uh, oral saliva tests persist for up to 90 days after the person first gets sick with COVID. The virus is no longer culturable. Uh, it's just little residual particles. Uh, and so the person's not contagious anymore. So the CDC guidance has said up to 20 days for your dialysis patients would make sense. And that's, and that's up to. And not to keep repeating the test. Now, the only population that I and have a little change of heart on there uh, is the I saw a study recently is in stem cell transplant patients uh, and, and CAR T therapy. And they've shown a small outlier group of those who actually have culturable virus for well past 20 days. But outside of that group, uh, I think 20 days is fine. Uh, and if you keep 
repeating the test and it's, it's positive or it goes negative to positive and positive to negative back and forth, that is uh, going to create more anxiety and angst among the healthcare workers and the patients than it will actually provide you any useful information. Okay. But that patient can receive the vaccine then as your as the current guidelines said yeah. after their yeah okay great and we have uh what time okay there's another one that came in question it says is it true the vaccine side effect is insomnia during the first few days i haven't read about a high degree of insomnia myself i uh, the one i i see most notably is headache and fatigue um i suppose you know some people could fatigue could be insomnia for them. It can be for me. Um, but a direct insomnia and sleeplessness due to the vaccine is, n is not a prevalent side effect um, I have seen reported. Dr. Silvers, have you? Yeah, I mean, I have no problems uh, with someone having insomnia after the vaccine in terms of they tell me that, and I totally believe them, especially after the second dose. It can happen after, after the first. But the side effects after the second dose are, are, are very common. And so, when, yeah, as uh, Lance was talking about, so they have headache and their their arms sore and they have fatigue and they're not hungry. Yeah, they probably aren't sleeping well either. So, um, I'm going to ask one last question because um, I, I think I would have known this answer a few days ago, but now again things are changing. So, does the second inoculation need to be the same vaccine as the first? <laughs> well, ideally it should, and that's the recommendation yeah. uh, that. Uh, you should go out of your way, if possible, to give the second dose with the same vaccine. Uh, if you can't do that because the patient shows up and you don't, for some reason, you're unable to determine which vaccine they first received. Right now, we only have mRNA vaccines out there, so you could give whichever mRNA vaccine that you have. That's a, that's a second choice. And it won't be long before we have the adenovirus vaccines, and then I think the CDC will take some sort of stance, which I'm not going to predict what they're going to say. Right. Yeah, things are going to get more complex and complicated, right? At this point, you know, as Dr. Silver said, you know, it's recommended to get the same vaccine. Um, however, the CDC does say if inadvertently a, a patient does get uh, Pfizer than Moderna or Moderna than Pfizer, um, mm -hmm. not to reseries them. They, they they consider that completely immunized, right, with two doses if they do receive one and the other. Perfect. Well, we're just about to our closing. So again, I want to thank you both for coming and having this uh, presentation and a lot of good information. We may be, you know, um, keep reaching out to you again in a couple months because it's ever very changing. So uh, for an update. So we really appreciate this. Um, but I can go on to the next slide and we'll kind of close up for today. I do want to remind everybody just our, about our flu vaccination toolkit that's on our website has uh, for providers. There's a lot of flu vax uh, facts and taglines that you can use. There's social media content. There's different flu videos that are downloaded on there, but all kinds of uh, material that's ready to print. And uh, this this particular webinar will be posted on there too as other on-demand training and educational events come out. So you can visit the esrdncc.org uh, back, backslash flu. Next slide. And just again, as a reminder, we have some inspirational posters also on our website. They are in PDF format for on-demand printing. They focus on psychological, physical, health, uh, emergency preparedness, and, of course, uh, COVID-19. Next slide. And I, if you were on early, we were showing uh, some slides about the Kidney Hub. We have a, it's a mobile friendly web tool created by patients for patients that links to a lot of new videos and resources always being updated. Uh, they have, there's diet and nutritional resources that are added, information about home dialysis, COVID, and transplant. And our next COVID-19 webinar events, we have a patient focused on February 2nd from at 4 p.m. And then our next provider is February 10th from 3 o'clock at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I uh, do want to remind everybody, if they do want CEUs to stay on after we close out, um, it will route you to a survey uh, evaluation that you can take and then uh, obtain your CEU certificate. Uh, next slide. And I believe that's it. So, again, thank you, uh, Dr. 
Silvers and Dr. Salazar for us uh, joining us today, and we really appreciate all of this wonderful information. The, uh, as a reminder to all the attendees, these will be posted on our website within three business days, the recording and the slide deck. So again, thank you, everybody. Have a great day and take care. Thank you all. Stay safe. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye now.